one for Kingston. So now I let Dan Malta on the air. And Dan, welcome aboard. And I assume this is your first time on the radio here. It is my first time. My first time walking over the the rink on the bridge, and it was frightening. Uh, I didn't expect the height to really grab me like that. <laughs> you know who else was scared of that? John Tavares. I was told by Andrew Edwards, the game day operations manager, that John Tavares hated that thing. So you, so you got some pretty good company there. I think you're in good good company. We don't have much in common, other than time spent in this building. But uh, yeah, and you're devilishly good looks too, right? <laughs> that's the other that's the other thing that you and JT have in common. But anyway, you were telling me just before we got on the air that you were at the uh, Silver Sticks tournament. Now I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on it. You were there, so obviously you know a little bit. Yep. Uh, let the people know what that's exactly about. Uh, 25th anniversary of the tournament, one of the biggest tournaments in all of North America. Uh, teams come from it's an international tournament. Teams come from St. Louis, Georgia, Detroit, everywhere, and it's pretty much a scouting haven uh, for the minor midget age group, which is the draft age group for the OHL. And there, I ran into the Gens general manager Jeff Tui. And what, did you talk at all? We, I, I didn't just look at him from afar. We went and talked. I asked him uh, some of the things that they actually look for when they're scouting a player, and he, he said to me that any idiot can walk into an arena and point out the best kid on the ice, but what he's really there looking for are the kids that are going to be going in the later rounds and the guys that are tough to pick, and you never know what they're going to turn into. And then I started asking him what kind of things they actually look for in the players, and believe it or not, the size of the parents – is a major major aspect that they look for. He right. told me about drafting Eric Stahl. He drafted Eric Stahl when he was five foot eleven, one hundred eighty five pounds. He turned into the six foot two, two hundred and five pound player that he is today. And I guess it's all just uh, kind of a grab bag of players. You never know what you're going to get, but sometimes things like that happen. So did he have a look at Eric Stahl's parents and go, "Okay, those are some mighty big parents. So let's uh, let's take a chance on Stahlzy." I don't know. Like he said, he said he didn't know how big Eric Stahl would get, and the fact that he did get that big turned him probably into the elite player he's at today. And it's so hard because when you're looking at some of these guys, they're what? 13, am I am I correct in years assuming old, about yeah. 13, 14, 15 yeah. around that? They're they're not done growing by a long shot. They you know, they could be five foot five and end up being six foot five. You have you have no way of knowing they could grow mm-hmm. a whole foot. So, you know, it's interesting that the parents are are the way that they that they look at that. But for the generals this season, a lot of people didn't think this team was going to be much of anything. Now, I came into the organization brand new. I didn't I didn't know. I knew Eric Lindros played here and Bobby Orr and you know John Tavares. I knew that, but any idiot off the street knows that this team was not expected to be a good team. By everybody, no. even by the local crowd, they thought. I, I remember some fans going, "Yeah, this is going to be a rough year, but we'll get them next year." All of a sudden, they're 12 points clear of Kingston, and what is the reason for that? I, I'm, I'm included in that group. I started covering the team last year in the Barry series, and they got swept. So I see them lose their two of their biggest players, and Tyler Biggs and Boone Jenner, and. Going into the season, I was doing stories on how there are no hopes for even the playoffs, and I feel like an idiot now. is isn't a stretch, but <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you what it is that they're doing it. When Scott Lawton came back, they were, they were already doing well. Then he came back, and he's like that shot in the arm that made them elite. Yeah, so, you know, we were talking. I got a, I got a tweet from Sean Bisson at The Observer in Sarnia, and he was talking generals with some people, and he, you know, he asked that, uh, you know, what are the generals looking to add, and what, what could they use on this team? I've I've harped on it. They need a number one defenseman and maybe some more scoring. Would you say that's an apt uh, proposal? I also talked to uh, Jeff Tui about the trade market right now in the OHL, and I said to him, with a team like Erie going out and acquiring a guy like Brendan Gauntz from Belleville, does it does it make you guys feel pressured to make a move? And he said, well, we don't really have any assets to move guys. They traded their third round draft pick for Josh Sturk. They don't have a second or a third this year, so they're kind of at a standstill with draft picks. Uh, and I don't know what assets they would really move, but I think that I, I agree with you there that they could use a really high-end defenseman. I just don't know where to get one. Yeah, they're always hard to come by, and everybody's looking for one, right? And how do you how do you deal with London, who has such a barrel of assets that they can they can throw anything they want at a, at a team? And we were there together watching the Subway Super Series, and Zadorov was head and shoulders literally above everybody and he's throwing his weight around he's NHL experience and it's just the London night way they always just find ways to continue to get better nobody knows how they do it I know we stayed there last night in London and I know a couple of general fans in Saginaw said no don't stay in London as 
they they really feel. But you know, this team it's been it's been such a rough go or such a good go of it after so many people talked about it being bad. But have you been able to see much behind the scenes with like the coaching staff or anything like that? Or what do you see out of DJ Smith that maybe wasn't there last year when you were here? Well, last year it seems to roll over pretty good. DJ Smith goes with his his best players, and one complaint that I hear sitting amongst the fans down there is that he's using his high-end players too much and that they're going to be worn out come playoff time. And that could have been the case, but also last year Scott Lawton was suspended in the playoffs. And Daniel Altshula this year, now he finally has Ken Appleby back to help him out. And I thought he was getting run quite a bit in those first two periods. Uh, you know what? I bet if David Branch is listening, and he's not, thank God, I would probably, they would probably call the generals and ask for my head. Because I let the referees have it. It's not even Branch's referee. It's the, it's the guy that came over from the QMJHL. I don't know why he's here, but he should go home. But do you feel the same way I do, that that was a poorly officiated, or am I just being biased? Uh, uh, yeah, you're not being biased. The two five-on-threes, the, the amount of penalties are going both ways. And did you see the Leafs game on Saturday yeah. when Colton Orr had his stick pushed away? I yeah. feel like that referee was watching the game because that penalty on Sam Harding, it's like he was just trying to clear the, the, the stick out of the area so if he got the puck, it wasn't going to mess him up. But that was an iffy penalty. I've seen a few iffy calls. That lemon one on Altshuler was just a bad decision on his part. Yeah, you know what? Like Sam Bennett, I was touching upon it in, in the broadcast, and I said that Bennett touched off that whole melee in uh, – in, in the first period mm-hmm. there, as he ran, he put Will Pechenik right down on the ice, and all of a sudden there's a Frontenac on top of, of Altshuler, and I'm thinking, okay, this has got to be a penalty for Kingston, and all of a sudden you turn around, and Oshawa's on the, bo- on the board for two, and Hunter Smith is in the box, and it's a five on three. A lot of people in the stands, and myself included, were, were wondering what exactly what was going on, but uh, I've never been a referee. I can't try and get in their heads. Uh, everybody's critiquing them all the time. It's a fast game, but I, again, I don't, I don't agree with what they're calling, but I don't think I know any better. Now, you and I were a couple of guys from the College of Sports Media in downtown Toronto, so this is our, our life passion to be in this kind of area. And a big deal goes down in the National Hockey League that's going to change the landscape of it for at least the next 12 years with Rogers taking control of Hockey Night in Canada. And I ended up seeing a picture of Nick Kiprios on H and I C and on Saturday, how tough is it going to be for guys like you and me now to get in with the old boys club at Rogers, taking control of basically all hockey in this country? I have no idea what to make of it. When when I saw that the deal happened, it was Bob McKenzie. He he was tweeting it after the Subway Super Series in Sudbury, and he I guess he had to pull over on the road to tweet it. And when I read it, I was just in shock. I didn't understand because I'd grown up watching TSN. They are what I like to watch. I Same love here. watching TSN's broadcast. Don Cherry said on Saturday night, "Just leave us alone." He said he knows he's the best, or he knows he's good, so don't touch him. To the Rogers guys, I also read Don Cherry's books, and he's so fiercely loyal to CBC because they brought him out of nowhere, and they've stuck with him for all those years, except for the multiple people who've tried to have him fired. He said he's so fiercely loyal in his book that he he really wouldn't go anywhere. And even when TSN was trying to pull him over during his contract negotiations in his book, he says that he's just fiercely loyal to the CBC. Yeah, and you know what? I don't understand what Roger's obsession would be. They already got one blowhard on the air all the time that people love in Bob McCowan. So what's the the difference of adding another one? And Bob knows he's a blowhard. He knows he tries to get stuff going. He likes to stir the pot a little bit. They always told us at our school that, you know, don't try and be like Bob McCowan. He had to get to that level after a little while, but I think Bob McCowan is just being himself, so I don't see the problem in keeping Don Cherry on those broadcasts. Oh, Don Cherry is... I I can't relate to him, but the guy is a a role model, I think, for a lot of Canadian people. A lot of people in North America, he just seems like a solid stand-up person. One of my bucket list items in life is to meet Don Cherry. You yeah. need to find a way to do that. He seems like such an honest character. But The knows? only thing about meeting Don Cherry, though, is that you're going to have to fight your way through thousands of people who are around him at the time. I don't know how you'll catch him alone unless he's taking an elevator up. Because I don't know if you remember at school, but Elliot Friedman once told me that they were in San Jose after a playoff game at about 12 o'clock at night. It had gone into overtime. And they're walking, and they say, Don, you want to get in a cab? He's like, no, it's San Jose, 12 yep. o'clock at night. Who, who the heck's going to recognize me? Next thing you know, 
Grapes is being chased by thousands of people who left their restaurants to go and talk to him. So yeah. that's just the power that Don Cherry has, and I think Rogers would be stupid to allow oh, him to go. I agree with you. And one more point on that before I have to get back down. Um, in his book, he touches on that. He used to drive his old Lincolns to Maple Leaf Gardens near Canada Center, but people got a cue on where he was going to be parking, and they mobbed him, so we had to take limos to the game every time. <laughs> all right, Dan, well, we'd like to thank you for joining us here tonight, and we look forward to all your sports reports on the uh, Channel 12. Yeah, thanks, man. All right, Dan, Dan Malta from Channel 12 News, sports reporter. Thanks a lot to him, and we will be back after a quick commercial break. You are listening to Oshawa Generals Hockey here on OntarioSportsRadio.com.